I love the people of God. Amen. I love the house of God. Amen. Glad to have Brother Preston back from Africa. And uh, glad he's back. Brother Marino. Um, I haven't seen him, but I trust he's back. Uh, they didn't leave him in Africa, did they? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, oh, I see him walking in right now. We'll not talk about Don't let him know I was talking about him, okay? Just be our little secret. You're going to tell, aren't you? I can tell it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark, chapter number 1. The book of Mark, chapter number 1. Uh, I'm going to have it here on the screen for you as well. But if you want to look at it, we're actually going to look at two different verses uh, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, and then we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew as well. Praise the Lord. Mark 1, verse 14 and 15 says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You uh, notice there, what are the two? Uh, competing or uh, repeating phrases there, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so tonight, um, I want to teach, preach, if I can, uh, on the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Will you pray with me and for me? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for what you've done already in the service, your presence that we felt, your touch, your help, God, your presence. God, I pray that you would uh, speak now, Lord, through your word. It is divinely inspired, God. It needs no help. It needs no additions, God. But Lord, I pray that you would help uh, your servant to speak it cl with clarity, God, that it would be understood and received, God, that your word would not go out forth void, but it would be uh, to the benefit of the people people of God, Lord, that your kingdom would advance. We love you and praise you for it in your name. Amen. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word of the Lord tonight. So, um, I'm going to teach, preach tonight, if that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to teach, and then I, there's points where I'm probably going to preach at you, uh, preach with you, preach here. Uh, but I'm going to start uh, by, by teaching and laying some groundwork and helping us understand this idea of the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, those are two words that are probably familiar, uh, but maybe not familiar together. And so, uh, with the Lord's help, we'll do that. The term gospel is a familiar one within Christianity, but what does it actually mean? What do we mean when we say, the word gospel. What does that mean? Somebody says, well, that's the gospel. Uh, what, what, what does that mean? Or what, specifically, what does it mean within Scripture? The Greek word for gospel, euangelion, it simply means good news. When you hear the word gospel, literally it means good message, good news. That's all that it means. The gospel is good news. It's good news. How many like good news? <laughs> I love good news. Uh, uh, I haven't seen too much on the news that's good news, but, but I like good news, don't you? I like good news. We get a lot of bad news. So the gospel literally just means good news. So if the gospel is good news, the question then must be asked, good news about what? Okay, we got good news, but good news about what? Good news that I got my tax refund back? That's good news. No, it's not good news? Is that bad news? No, uh, you got a raise, or you, uh, you know something, something like that happened. Is that the good news that we're talking about? No, it's not. Good news about what? Our text tells us that the good news, the gospel, is about the arrival or the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. The arrival or the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. So, if the gospel, the good news, is about the arrival of the kingdom of God, what's the kingdom of God? So we got good news. Tell your neighbor, we got good news. Woo, good news. It's the gospel about the kingdom of God. But what is the kingdom of God? Simply put, the kingdom of God is the place where God's sovereignty rules over humanity. 
The kingdom of God is the place where God's sovereign, God's rule, his rulership, his reigning, his sovereignty rules over humanity. And and, and there is no kingdom without power, laws, which govern the structure of the kingdom. There's no kingdom without people. Can't have a kingdom without people, can you? Citizens that that live within that kingdom. And there's no kingdom without place or location which to dwell in. So the kingdom of God centers around power, people, and place. Okay? Stay with me. We're going somewhere, okay? Power, people, and place. Not just any power. We're talking about God's power. Not just any people, but we're talking about God's power. People, and not just any place, but we're talking about God's place. Okay, the kingdom of God is God's power over God's people in God's place. Okay, in the beginning, God created people and place by His power for the purpose of establishing His kingdom on the earth. And within Eden, God's kingdom first tabernacled on earth. As he communed with Adam and Eve. You know the story in the garden? God comes down in the cool of the evening. And he he communes with with Adam and Eve in the garden. And Eden is a representation. Or it is a place where God's kingdom comes. And it dwells on this earth. As God is dwelling with humanity for the very first time ever. God is dwelling with humanity. God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world are united in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil provides a choice for Adam and Eve. Will they choose God's kingdom or through their own wisdom seek to build their own kingdom? How many of you know how that worked out? You don't know how that worked out? Didn't work out very good, did it? What happened? Tragically, Adam and Eve choose to seek their own wisdom and go against God's kingship by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, what Adam and Eve did in the garden wasn't just a mistake, but it was a choice. They chose, God said, you can have all this creation, all this goodness that I have created for you. A perfect environment. Everything was perfect. And God says, there's just one thing. Do not eat of this one tree, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of that. Everything else you can have, but what is it within man's spirit that wants what God does not want them to have? How, how, what is that within our nature that desires what God says don't have? And so they do. And this rebellious choice instituted a corrupt kingdom made by man, which then utterly separates them from God's kingdom. You see, what happened in the garden wasn't just a uh, just a uh, act of sin, but it was an act of a separation, an act of separating between God's kingdom and man setting up his own kingdom. I know better than you, God. I know what needs to. I'm going to be my own king. You ever tried to be your own king or queen? Nobody. Just 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 me. I know what's best. I know what I need to do. I know how I can handle this situation. I have the wisdom. I know good and evil. I know what, and and every time we seek wisdom in our own self, we find that it brings separation. And so God's kingdom dwelling in Eden is God's kingdom and man's kingdom is united. But after sin comes in, there's a separation. God's kingdom, uh, they're kicked out of the garden of Eden. They're kicked out of uh, having the presence of God on a daily basis communing with God no longer do they have that because they're seeking to build their own kingdom yet in that God promises that from the seed of Eve a king will be will bring restoration of God's kingdom on this earth he says there's coming one who's going to bruise the head of the serpent destroy him there's one who's going to come and restore what God has done. And so thus, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, God's people are looking for this promised king who will restore the kingdom of God back to earth. And so through covenant relationship, God gives this responsibility first to Noah. You remember the story. God makes a, uh, ha- has a covenant with Noah. He said, I'm never going to flood the earth again. We have, have this, this man who is right. 
righteous. He, he's, uh, he's uprighteous and he follows God and, and there's this flood. And, oh, you know the story. I don't have to go through it. But, but in that moment, the flood comes. God, you know Noah comes out of the ark. God makes a covenant with Noah and tells him by the sign of a rainbow, they'll never do this again. And what happens right after that? Noah gets drunk. The covenant does not last. Abraham, God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, Abraham. And Abraham creates Ishmael, trying to make his own kingdom through Ishmael. And it's corrupted. And we still deal with the implications of that today. So Abraham fails. The nation of Israel, Exodus 19, the Bible tells us that God comes down to Moses uh, and the children of Israel there on Mount Sinai and says, I'm making a covenant with you, Israel. You are going to be my chosen people. So we see first he starts with, with, a, 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 with a, a one man a, a, and then a family, a descendant, and then he goes to a nation. It says, nation of Israel, you're going to be my people. That's why the laws uh, of the Old Testament are the way they are, is God saying, I'm marking you as different from all the other nations from all the other people groups, you are mine, Israel. You're not like everybody else. You're mine. And there in Exodus 19, the people of Israel said, yes, we accept that covenant. We want that. (laughs) You ever read the Old Testament? They break it a lot, don't they? They do not fulfill it. They continually rebel against God. They seek idols I mean, even in that story, right after this moment, God gives him the Ten Commandments, a wonderful moment. Moses hasn't even got down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments for the people of Israel of how they're going to live differently, how they're going to live in covenant, and they're already got an idol built out of the gold. They've already got a calf come out. I mean, it's just two seconds later. Quick to go to idols. We're not so different, are we? Quick to go to idols. King David, we see him, a man after God's own heart, good man, but yet he falls, adultery, fornication, or adultery, and then he kills Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. King Solomon builds the temple, but man, he's got some issues. He likes, he likes women, he gets them in trouble. So all these people fail. And tragically, the restoration of the kingdom hope fails with each attempt as as humanity continues to rebel and seek its own kingdom. However, we look to the Gospels, the New Testament, we find a radical proclamation. The kingdom of God has arrived in the person of Jesus. Through the incarnation, God became flesh and dwelt among us. So the sovereign rule of God was embodied in a human person, Jesus. The sovereign rule of of God was was dwelling within a person, and that person's name was Jesus. Everywhere that Jesus went, he was doing kingdom work. Everywhere that Jesus went, everything that he did, he said, he says, for I cannot, I came not down from heaven, uh, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. The reason why I'm here is to do kingdom business. The reason why Jesus walked this earth was not because he had his own agenda, but because he had God's agenda to bring, to reunite the kingdom of heaven back to this earth. That this earth could see what it looked like when heaven walked on earth. And so the central message of Jesus' teaching centered around the teaching of the kingdom. And a careful survey of the Gospels finds he speaks about it over 80 times. If you'll read through your New Testament and you'll just search through, search the kingdom of God, you'll see over and over and over again, over 80 times, Jesus is always talking about the kingdom of God. That's kind of a foreign phrase for us. What do you mean the kingdom of God? What is he talking about? From that time, the Bible says, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, synonyms, same thing. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven 
is at hand. Undeniably, the mission and message of Jesus was to teach and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God. The good news about the kingdom of God. The good news is that the kingdom of God has come to this earth. No longer is there need to be a separation between God's kingdom and man's kingdom, man's desires, but there has been a unifying in the man, Christ Jesus. And so Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and manners of diseases among the people. He's preaching about the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom has come. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for therefore I am sent. And, and once you see that Jesus' central message was to proclaim the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God's arrival in himself, you can't unsee it. It's everywhere in scripture, this kingdom idea that God has desired, he's always desired that his kingdom would rule on this earth. Isn't that what the Lord's prayer is? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth here. That, that, that what God's kingdom is about, that God's rulership would be ruled on this earth, that God's ways would be exemplified in this earth, that God's rulership would be seen in this earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as the heavenly ambassador of the gospel of the kingdom, through the life and teaching of Jesus reveals the character of of the kingdom. I'm, I'm, I'm moving quickly, I promise. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first thing he ever preaches, he says, Matthew 5 and th verse 3, blessed are, blessed are those who are humble, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The very first sermon, the very first words out of Jesus' mouth when he preaches is about humility and the kingdom. This whole chapter is the Sermon on the Mount. Persecution and suffering are characteristics of the kingdom. Ooh, that doesn't sound too exciting. Let's skip that one. Jesus said, my mission to come here was to suffer and die. He said, I didn't come to be served or to be ministered to, but I came to minister and so a characteristic of the kingdom is one of persecution and trials. James said, he said, don't think it strange, brethren and sisters, when, when you have different trials and temptations, although some strange thing has happened unto you. It, it, it's part of living in the kingdom is we have persecution. Obedience to the law of the king, not self-righteous, praying for the advancement of the kingdom, kingdom authority belongs to the king. All these things are characteristics of the kingdom. He, he talks about it. Uh, often he reveals the character of the gospel of the kingdom through parables. Matthew 13, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower. The kingdom of heaven is like a sower who goes out and sows. He sows. That's what the kingdom of God is, it's sowing. It's sowing. It's sowing the word of God into people's life. The kingdom of God is sharing God's word in this world. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's spreading the good news. Spreading it everywhere you can. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Just like Jesus came and he did that. He, he shared the good news with whoever he could. That is the kingdom of heaven. It's like that. The, the kingdom of heaven is like unto uh, wheat and tares. So the kingdom of heaven is like wheat and tares. They, they grow up the same. They look somewhat the same. But when harvest comes, there's a difference. There's a separation. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's little, small. Most people don't see much value in it. But when it grows, it grows into a ginormous tree that it has... Huge, 
huge significance. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is something that is, is not popular. It's not in vogue. It's not something that, that everyone's clamoring for. But there's coming a day, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself too much, but there's coming a day when the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is coming back and is ruling and reigning on this earth again. And then it's going to be shown those who are part of the kingdom of God. Parable of the pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who saw a pearl in a field. And he sold everything that he had in order to get that pearl. The kingdom of God is valuable. It's worth everything. It doesn't matter what you have in this life. If you have the kingdom of God living inside of you, you have it all. You have what truly matters. The kingdom of heaven living inside of you. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter what else you have because it's all going to burn up anyways. But the kingdom of heaven is valuable. King parable of the great net. Kingdom of heaven is like a, a net. It's drawn people in. The disciples came and said, and Why are you speaking to the human parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Yet because the gospel of the kingdom of God is opposed to the kingdom of this world, many re- despise and reject the kingdom of God. And when he had demanded of the Pharisees, and when the kingdom of God should come, The Bible says uh, that Jesus said, and he said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. In your midst. He's saying, the Pharisees are asking, when is the kingdom of God coming? Because they understand this from the Old Testament. I'll have time to get into all that. But they understand that the kingdom of God is coming. And so they're asking, when is the kingdom of God coming? And he says, you're looking here, you're looking there, and I'm telling you, I am the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is right here looking at, oh man, it made them mad because they recognized what he was saying. He was saying that he was God. He was saying that he was, that that heaven was him and that he was heaven embodied. And just as the Pharisees hated Jesus in his message and the gospel of the kingdom, the spirit of this age is hostile to the gospel of the kingdom of God. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, Ooh, that's strong. How many want Jesus for a revival? For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against me. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entered to go in. He's saying, Pharisees, you're hindering people from going into the kingdom of heaven. Your actions are causing people not to go into the kingdom of heaven. Oh God, let it never be. That my actions, my words would prevent somebody from entering to the kingdom of heaven. But having accepted the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and having yielded ourselves to the king, we have been appointed as ambassadors of Christ's mission. Jesus said, this is at the Last Supper, he says to his disciples, I have appointed unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed me. At the Last Supper, Jesus' final words to his disciples is this. He's saying, this kingdom that God has given me, that I am a representative of, and that I've been teaching you about, and I've been showing you, I've been living in front of of you, I am now appointing you, Matthew, James, John, all, all these different designs. I'm anointing you. I am appointing you. Now you are to go and be not just my disciples, but you are to be representatives of the kingdom in this world. So every believer has been given the divine appointment to represent the good news of the kingdom of God in this world. Therefore, the mission of the church is to proclaim the message of the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God to all the nations. That's our, our, our job is to tell the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news that the king has come. 
Hey, the king has come in Jesus and that he is coming again and that he is coming back for a church, for a bride without spot or wrinkle that is washed in the blood of the lamb. And so he says in his final words to his disciples, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. The end is coming. I said the end is coming. How many believe the end is coming? And our duty as the church is to proclaim the good news of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom to whoever, wherever, however that we can to live the good news of the gospel until he comes. Some ways to do this. One simple way is to proclaim it. Tell somebody about the good news. I got some good news for you. It's supposed to cool down. Is that good news? <laughs> Is it true? Eventually it will cool down. <laughs> no promises. Good news. It's going to cool down. We'll talk about that good news, won't we? Good news. Cowboys are going to lose again. Talk about that. Good news, there's a sale. Good news, the kingdom has come. Jesus has come. And he has come to save us from our sins. The king has come. Proclaiming the gospel, prayer, through prayer. Jesus taught us, pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me. God, let your kingdom rule in me. Let it not be my kingdom that I'm trying to build. Let it not be my agenda, my will, but God, let it be your kingdom, God, that is in me. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. Isn't that what Jesus said in the garden as he's sweating great drops of blood? He he said, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's what he's praying. He's praying for the kingdom's will to be done. Because he was obedient to the kingdom's will. I have an ability to be a part of the kingdom. You have the opportunity to be a part of the kingdom. To be his representatives on this earth. So pray for the kingdom. Pray for the kingdom's will in your life. In your family. In our church. Also be filled with the spirit. You remember, Jesus, Jesus died, he was resurrected, and the disciples are amazed at this. And Acts chapter 1, the Bible tells us the disciples ask Jesus, they say, okay, Jesus, is this the time when you're going to set up your kingdom? They, they understand this whole idea of kingdom really well. And so they ask Jesus, okay, uh, we thought it was going to be one way, you got you know, crucified and died, that was not in our plan, but you resurrected again, so we're back in business. Is this the time when you're going to set up your kingdom? And Jesus says, the times and the seasons, you don't understand. He says, but go to Jerusalem and tarry there until you be endued with power from on high. He says, go be filled with the Spirit. Because I'm going away. I'm departing. But, but it's actually better for you that I do. Because when I leave, the comforter is coming. The helper is coming. Uh, the paraclete, he's coming. And he's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. And you are going to be able, you're going to be endued with power to be my witnesses. Being filled with the Spirit enables us, empowers us to be God's representatives. To be able... To have the fruit of the Spirit in times when the flesh wants to rise up. Nobody else struggles with the flesh, right? To have the, the gifts of the Spirit in operation in our church, in our lives, be filled with the Spirit. 
For the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it's not physical things, but it's righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of, of God, the kingdom of heaven, it's not about physical things, but it's about spiritual things. It's not about the, uh, the, the numbers of digits in your bank account. It's not about the things of this world, although they are important, but it's not about those things. It's not about food and drink. It's not about sustenance. It's about the kingdom of God. But righteousness, oh God, I want to be righteous. It's about peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And joy. The Holy Ghost. We proclaim the gospel of the kingdom through being spirit filled in our actions and attitudes. The world is looking for a church that will not just talk about the gospel, but will live it. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is it's not just about talk, but there's a power to it. As the kingdom of God lives within us, there's power that comes into our lives. Not a, a, a physical power, but a supernatural power that helps us to think differently, that helps us to walk differently than we could in our own. This world is looking for a church that will live the gospel of the kingdom with power. With supernatural power. Musicians come, I'm just about done. Stand with me if you will. Heavenly Father, Lord, I've done my best to proclaim this word that you've birthed within me, God. Help us to once again put our focus back on the good news. It's so, it, 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 it can become so simple, it can become so cliche, it can become so uh, normative in our life that we forget how good it is that the kingdom of God has come and dwelt with us. That, that God incarnate, that Emmanuel, God with us, would come as a helpless crying baby would suffer in this life would eventually be murdered on a cross having done nothing wrong but yet the thief on the cross next to him said when you enter into your kingdom remember me God, we know your kingdom is, is come in, in, in your son. And we thank you that it has, it has been allowed that we would be your representatives of the kingdom. God, we're unworthy of that. We, we, we don't do it as well as we ought. But God, we, we pray, we ask you, God, to help us to be your kingdom representative in this world. So that a lost and dying world could see the good news. Could see the good news that the king has come and that he is coming again God I want to be ready for the king is coming that's your prayer would you come and find you a place in this altar right now would you find you a place in this altar and begin to pray about, about how you could